where there's no bias and no agenda. Many media organizations promote balanced reporting, but few are immune to bias. I started witnessing this sort of new racial ideology spreading throughout the company. This week, an unusual perspective from a data scientist who worked with a major international media group and spoke up about the agenda within. So what does this story that you've told say about the news industry? For two years, we've reported on the controversial Alzheimer's drug aducanumab approved by the FDA, even though data was said to be weak. They approved it even though not one of the advisors they had consulted said it should be approved. They did. Even as Congress investigates what went wrong with the first drug, the FDA has approved a similar second drug made by the same company. This month, there was a huge concern about a Chinese orb seen in the sky. But balloons might not be the biggest worry. Are you concerned about the tensions that exist here now existing on the moon and beyond? They say they're going to land on the moon. And they usually do what they say they're going to do. Welcome to Full Measure. I'm Cheryl Ackeson. Today we begin with an incredible story of a data scientist who claimed extreme bias at a major global news service, Reuters. Zach Kriegman may be one of the highest company officials to go public with such allegations. He led a team of scientists applying the latest breakthroughs in artificial intelligence to data at the parent company, Thomson Reuters. He says he watched as radical ideologies took hold throughout the organization and that when he saw the news division getting it wrong, he was the one who got bullied and fired. We tell all sides, but take none. This disturbing story begins at Reuters, a media conglomerate and news agency that reaches billions of people a day. It promises freedom from bias. Where there's no bias and no agenda. But the hard truth inside Reuters was far different than the advertisements, according to Zach Kriegman, who was the company's director of data science. Kriegman says he was subjected to a racially hostile environment, then terminated after he complained about it. So it began really when I started witnessing this sort of new racial ideology spreading throughout the company um, and people embracing the core tenets of the Black Lives Matter from the, you know, the senior leadership all the way down. It started when Kriegman says he noticed the news division pushing a one-sided narrative in support of the Black Lives Matter core claim that police are biased towards shooting black people. And I found out that that core claim was false. What you discover is that police shoot whites disproportionately to the rate that whites murder police officers, white criminals murder police officers, and they do not shoot black suspects disproportionately to the rate at which black criminals murder police officers. In fact, they shoot substantially less black suspects than you would predict based on the number of police officers murdered by black criminals. Kriegman says as a data scientist, he relied on a wide body of research, including from African-American researcher Roland Fryer. The research further implied, he says, that the allegedly false storyline about police shooting blacks was actually responsible for the deaths of black people. But not only that, the research also showed that that claim was driving these huge reductions in policing, uh, which corresponded to soaring violent crime, including thousands of murders. Um, of black people, of, primarily. primarily. black people. Black Lives Matter falsehoods were driving thousands of murders or causing thousands of murders of black people, people who would be alive today if not for those falsehoods. So I knew that as like a white employee, I couldn't say anything critical about the Black Lives Matter without putting my career in jeopardy at Thomson Reuters. But is, isn't that a problem to begin with? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a huge problem. And it's not just about Black Lives Matter. There's this whole uh, racial ideology. I think there, it's highly connected. And I felt like, you know, Thomson Reuters had a public trust to be reporting truthfully, and we were failing. 
So you have this information, you think it's important, ethically important to the news organization, but you're worried about bringing it forward. What did you decide to do? Yeah, so I actually wrestled with this, uh, and, you know, I talking it over with my wife because I knew, you know, I could potentially lose my job just even talking about uh, these issues. So ultimately, I decided to basically just summarize the academic research uh, into a post that I, that I posted on an internal forum um, to try to just start a discussion. What was the response you got? So, just as I had feared, <laughs> the response was incredibly angry, you know, personal attacks directed at me, but also like highly racialized attacks. They told me I was confused and laughable, I was a troll, I wasn't even worth attempting to have a con uh, an intelligent conversation with. They actually even compared me to a sympathizer of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, it just got incredibly nasty, incredibly quickly. Kriegman says he complained to the Human Resources Department at Reuters that racialized attacks against him were blocking an important discussion about the veracity of Reuters reporting. The result, he was fired. What did they say was your lapse? And the actual email, they fired me by email. The actual email they said just said, um, your conduct in recent weeks does not align with our expectations of you as a leader within the organization, so we're firing you. You were a manager earning six figures, is that right? Yep. Had you ever been taken a task for anything with your job before? Nope. I had uh, I'd been working there for six years. I would just recently gotten a huge promotion from senior data scientist to director of data science. The only thing they could say uh, was that, you know, they didn't like my conduct, which was consisted in recent weeks, which consisted entirely of trying to start a discussion about how our reporting was inconsistent with the facts. Reuters declined our interview request, but a spokesman told us Kriegman held no editorial position at the company and that Reuters reports on topics related to race and equality and the BLM organization in a fair, unbiased, and independent manner. Kriegman isn't the only one who's called the news industry into question. In 2020, New York Times opinion editor Barry Weiss told a similar story. She quit her job saying she faced smears and constant bullying by colleagues who have a woke agenda, but that the Times refused to take action on her harassment allegations. The Times responded saying it's committed to publishing viewpoints from across the political spectrum and fostering honest, searching and empathetic dialogue between colleagues. A Canadian Broadcasting Corporation CBC reporter Tara Henley quit her job last year citing a radical political agenda. The CBC disputes her view, but Henley claimed that working at the CBC now is to pretend that the woke worldview is near universal, even if it is far from popular with those you know and speak to and interview and read. CBC reacted by saying it does not apologize for broadening and deepening our journalism by bringing more voices and perspectives to our stories. Other journalists have quit their jobs complaining of conservative bias, with the larger point being that many are claiming ideology rather than information is what now dominates at many of today's most influential news organizations. So what does this story that you've told say about the news industry? I mean, it's my understanding that this same kind of, like, um, you know, racial ideology and sort of uh, and the bullying that goes along with it, really, I think hand in hand, is prevalent throughout the news industry. What is it that you think people should know or take away from this as news consumers? You shouldn't really ever consider yourself fully informed if you're really just reading from one side of the political spectrum. It's sort of like, you know, as a lawyer or former lawyer, um, I think of it like uh, our adversarial system. Like, no one would ever consider it okay for the jury to render a verdict after hearing just the prosecution or just the defense. And yet that's what we do every single day as voters. We'll read only one side from one part of the political spectrum and we'll consider ourselves informed. And I think we've got to move away from that. Kriegman has filed a complaint over his firing with the Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination, a required step before he can move forward with a lawsuit against Reuters. Ahead on Full Measure, important questions about yet another new Alzheimer's drug.
Now an important update to our coverage of a new Alzheimer's drug that drew so much controversy. Aducanumab was approved without one yes vote from the FDA advisory committee. In fact, several members quit over it. And critics say it offers no proof of real benefit but comes with significant health risks. Now the FDA has given fast track approval to a similar drug made by the same company under what critics see as similar questionable circumstances. The new drug is an injection called lecanemab. Dr. Sidney Wolf is with the health research group of the Watchdog Public Citizen. He's criticizing the FDA's expedited approval, saying there's no proof of the drug's real benefit, but plenty of risks. In the study, they showed clearly that compared to a placebo, a sugar pill, that the brain swelling was much, much higher. You get brain swelling just with Alzheimer's disease either, but it was twice as frequently occurring in the people who got lecanemab. So to critics like Wolf, the FDA's expedited approval of lecanemab only compounds the fast-tracked approval of a similar drug by the same company as we've reported here on Full Measure. Aducanumab, sold as Aduhelm, is given as an injection every four weeks. But there's a long shadow that's loomed over the medicine ever since the FDA gave it the green light. They approved it even though not one of the advisors they had consulted said it should be approved. They did. I mean, Dr. I Caleb know. Alexander was one of the I FDA advisors know. who voted against aducanumab's approval. He's an epidemiologist, internist, and professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. The advisory committee, there was near, um, near consensus among the advisory panel uh, that there just wasn't the evidence to warrant approval. Much of the controversy centers on the FDA's overt advocacy of a medicine that had failed miserably during the test phase. Drug maker Biogen stopped its two major studies midstream, determining that aducanumab performed so poorly it was futile to go on. But within months, Biogen returned to the FDA, claiming to have found some evidence of benefit within the stop studies. And the FDA enthusiastically endorsed the drug without a single of the completed large studies normally required. But I do think that this is really an exceptional setting, not only because of the incredible unmet demand for treatments, um, but, but because in this instance, the FDA's decision making uh, uh, appears to have been at such odds with not just the recommendation of the advisory committee members, but also the recommendations of many other parties. The drug maker says aducanumab, sold as aduhelm, and the newer drug lecanemab, sold as lecembi, are effective at removing a sticky type of plaque in the brain that Alzheimer's produces. Some theorize that plaque makes the disease advance. Critics question whether that's the case at all and say the modest impact of the drugs shown in early studies isn't impressive. One of the lecanemab study scientists agrees more research is needed, but says... It's very exciting because this is the first treatment in our history that shows an unequivocal slowing of decline in Alzheimer's disease. Would I like the numbers to be higher? Of course, but I don't think this is a small effect. These results could also indicate a starting point for bigger effects. What would be the takeaway for people who aren't going to dig deep into this issue, but they hear there are new Alzheimer drugs that some say could be promising? but they know there's some criticism. Well, one of the takeaways is that there are a number of, I think, the brighter and more accomplished Alzheimer's researchers that think that this study on lecanemab doesn't show that it really works enough. I and mean, the difference between how much less cognitive loss there was between the placebo and the drug is minuscule. It, one of these people said, essentially, the difference between the placebo and the drug is so small that doctors wouldn't recognize it, patients or their families wouldn't recognize it. It's too small. Aducanumab's price was $56,000 per year. The drug maker slashed that in half when it appeared few, if any, doctors would prescribe it. Medicare generally won't pay for it. The new drug, lecanemab, is going for $26,500 a year wholesale. When we come back, America's rivalry with China blasts off toward a new arena.
The recent U.S. conflict with China over mystery objects in the sky is a reminder that we are in an economic and political rivalry with the communist nation, one that extends into space, as Lisa Fletcher reports. Good December 8. Splashdown. The December splashdown of the most powerful rocket NASA has ever made, Artemis, was the successful conclusion to a mission laying the groundwork to take Americans back to the moon and beyond. And while Artemis has fortified U.S. resolve to go back to the lunar surface, the real question is, what do you do when you get there? Because our biggest rival is putting a tremendous amount of energy into launching a new space station, building bigger rockets, and developing plans that make ours seem a little small. There's really no area that China is not seeking to eclipse the United States, and of course the military is one as well. Retired Air Force Colonel Peter Gerritsen spent a good part of his military career thinking about space as a strategic planner. He's now with the American Foreign Policy Council think tank. His new book is called The Next Space Race. What does the average American need to be aware of in terms of China's activity in space? So I think the first thing is just to realize how different it is this time than the last space race. So the last space race really was for a global audience and it was about prestige. It was about getting somewhere first. And this time it's completely different. This time it's about building an industrial off-Earth supply chain that is going to affect economic power you know, for two centuries to come and probably will affect uh, our children and grandchildren much sooner. That's one small step for man. In the first space race, it was the U.S. versus the Soviets, a Russia-led union of communist countries. This time, our rival is the Chinese. But one element has stayed the same. It's all about who's first. And China has made no secret of its intentions. It sees the moon and space as a resource to exploit. Prioritizing mining the moon for minerals and water and nearby asteroids for metal elements so critical to the world's high-tech products from defense to computers. It's also designing giant satellites to capture enough solar energy to power our planet and developing space-to-ground weapon systems. Are we making the same plans? Are we looking at, at the same sorts of things that they are? I don't think so. We're not talking about developing the moon industrially as an end. In fact, if you look at the White House uh, cislunar strategy, it's not one of the key goals. But it is a key goal for the Chinese. They're already planning to launch rovers to explore the moon's south pole, setting up a potential race to gather resources. On the moon, they've looked at what are the areas of the moon, and these are principally the poles. So because of the, the unique geometry of the moon, the mountains on the, pole, on the north and south pole get nearly constant sunlight, and the craters on the, uh, get no sunlight at all, and so they've trapped water, Great Lakes worth of water, uh, which is a tremendous logistical uh, resource. And so in the same way that NASA has mapped out where it might want to go, uh, China has mapped out nearly identical areas of where they think would be important to go. Is it just a matter of who gets there first? It probably is a matter of who gets there first. And then you stake a flag and it's mine? Well... How is this going to work? We don't know. When Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin placed the American flag on the moon in 1969, it was just a symbolic gesture. Most nations, including the U.S. and China, have signed the Outer Space Treaty, saying territory can't be claimed. But countries can build facilities where they want, and others can't interfere with them. When I met NASA Administrator Bill Nelson just before Artemis launched, he was keenly alert to China's geopolitical plans for the moon. With regard to China, you uh, recently made some statements of concern about them possibly using the moon as a military strategic <coughs> destination. What brought you to that conclusion about their operations? Because they're so secretive. Since China has a very good space program, and they say they're going to land on the moon, and they usually do what they say they're going to do in space. 
So is it beyond the realm of possibility that they land on the South Pole where the water is? If there's water, there's rocket fuel, hydrogen and oxygen. The Chinese get there, it's always the possibility that they say, you stay out, this is our exclusive zone. As we've reported before on Full Measure, China has repeatedly ignored international law, taking over disputed territory in the South China Sea and building military bases to expand its reach. The concern, it may try to do the same in space. China's long-term plan is to create a Moon Earth economic zone. And they hope that by 2050, that Moon Earth economic zone will be returning $10 trillion of economic activity every year. They are really trying to create a fourth industrial revolution that is truly where I think uh, the, the next century is going to be decided. While Gerritsen says the U.S. still has the edge in space technology, the Chinese will likely catch up within a decade. How important is it that the U.S. get this right? I actually can't think of a more important thing that the United States and U.S. policymakers need to be thinking about that's going to affect our children and grandchildren than accessing the largest possible uh, trove of resources that's going to determine who is the economic power for at least the next two centuries. So, in the new space race, the ultimate prize is not prestige, but economic domination. And that contest could turn into a conflict a quarter million miles above Earth. Any idea of the timeline for China's ambitions? Yeah, pretty soon. China has already published a document that says it's going to see itself as the number one space power by 2045. Well, it seems like whenever we hear the U.S. talking about things in space, we're focusing on science and technology, not so much the economic aspect. Yeah, that's true. Last fall, the White House came out with a strategy document, and it listed goals like advancing science and technology and research and not things like mining the moon or mining the asteroid belt. All right, we'll keep an eye on it. Thanks a lot, Lisa. Mm -hmm. And when we come back, what's ahead next week on Full Measure? Coming up next week on Full Measure, there's an incredibly important power play being made in Latin America by China. Geopolitically speaking, they're making moves and they're giving signs of growing importance to Latin America, and the U.S. is not. Wait until you hear how China is expanding its footprint and influence adjacent to the U.S. and why it matters to all of us next week on Full Measure. Thanks for watching, everybody. Until next time, we'll be searching for more stories that hold powers accountable. I'm Cheryl Ackerson.